many of you, help me out, how many of you have some family traditions that you do at Christmas time? Come on, raise your hand. If you have it, be like, a few of you, right? Like, is how are we going to open the presents or when are we going to do the presents or we're going to go, all go get hot chocolate and watch, you know, go look around at the Christmas lights or put up the tree or sing the songs or whatever it is that you're going to do at Christmas. And I, I noticed that it's kind of funny that you have those family Christmas traditions, but then when you get married, they kind of collide, you know what I'm saying? And you kind of have kind of this conflict that's kind of going on. I know when I was a kid growing up, like Christmas morning was not really the big deal in my house growing up. We had family that lived in Oklahoma, and so we would kind of do Christmas two or three days early, and then we'd all drive to Oklahoma. We very rarely did like Christmas morning with my family when I was just a little kid. But then I got married, and Amber, her family was complete opposite of that, because in her family, it was like Christmas morning was the thing. How many of you, that's how it is, and you're like, you know what I'm talking about? You wake up on Christmas morning, and you're like super early and you're in your PJs and stuff. So even after we got married, Amber has a brother that's younger and and two sisters that are younger. They were still living at home. And so even after we got married, we would wake up early on Christmas morning, even in our PJs, not even taking a shower, drive over to Amber's house and open our gifts. And I tell you what, like when we started to open our gifts, my eyes were opened because the way that they did it was so different than the way we did it growing up, right? (laughs) In fact, I just got to tell you, like when we were growing up, we loved to savor the gift opening experience on Christmas morning. Some of you are nodding your heads because you know what I'm talking about. Because here we would pass out all the gifts and then we would pray a prayer and sing a song and read the Christmas story. And then we would go one by one. Come on, how many of you do this, right? And it's like open the gift. And then when you get done, open the gift. You hold it up for a picture. Thanks, mom. Come on, you know what I'm talking about about right and then the next person opens their gift oh thank you mom and hold it up for a picture and then the next one and we got a pile of gifts you know what I'm saying and so this takes like four hours to have the Christmas morning experience right come on right But then I got married to Amber, and I go over there on that first Christmas morning, and I'm telling you, they pass out the gifts, and they're a pretty big family. They pass out the gifts. There's all these gifts. There's no prayer. There's no Christmas songs. There's no Christmas story. As soon as the gifts are passed out, there's wrapping paper going everywhere, and people are just opening all their gifts all at the same time, and stuff is flying, and I'm going, is it my turn? Well, I guess I'm supposed to just go ahead and open, and I I'm telling you, over the years, I believe that there have been gifts that have actually been lost in the mountain of wrapping paper in the middle, got thrown away by accident. Come on, how many know what I'm talking about? All right. And here's what I've discovered, is there are many different ways to celebrate Christmas, and I love all of the traditions, and here's what I was thinking about as I was preparing for this message. There's really no right way or wrong way to celebrate Christmas, right? But when it comes to life, there is some right ways and some wrong ways. There are some ways that are better than other ways, and that's what I wanted to talk about this morning. In fact, I'll just be honest. Like whenever I start thinking about Christmas, I start getting a little bit, you know, anxious when it comes to the Christmas sermon. Because I don't know if you know this, but this is my 17th time to preach a Christmas sermon at LifeGate. Yeah. Now that sounds cool and exciting, except for that there's only like three or four passages that you can preach from. Come on, right? And I'm like, I've preached from all these passages. What, what am I going to say that's different or a new angle? And so I started thinking about this idea of how do people live? We have traditions at Christmas, and there's no right or wrong, but when it comes to life, there are some ways that are better than other ways, right? And I started, I just wrote down a few ways that people kind of try to live. So if you're taking notes, you can write them down. I mean, some people, this is how they like to live their life. They like to live the easy way. Everybody say the easy way. Come on, how many know someone who likes to take the easy way, right? How, some of you like, like, I'm that kind of person. I like life to be easy. In fact, it, it kind of, you know, made me think about the commercial that was out a few years ago. I think it was Office Depot or maybe Staples or something like that. And it had this commercial where it had this little button. How many remember what it was? It was the, the easy button and like you just push the button and it made everything super easy. And, and wouldn't it be nice if life was like that, right? 
And so many of us, I think that's the philosophy of life, is like, I just want things to be easy. I'm going to take the easy way out. And, and guess what? Let me just tell you something. Easy is nice, but it's not always best, right? But so many people try to live the easy way in life, but that's not necessarily the best way for us to live. In fact, I was just thinking about like a few examples. Maybe, maybe you can help me out on some of these examples. Just like which one's easier and which one's better, right? Like, like eat fast food all the time or cook at home a nice healthy meal with vegetables. Which one's easier, which one's better? Yeah, well, I think better is no vegetables, but that's a whole different thing, right? But which one's better? Of course, right? I mean, think about like maybe, you know, just say whatever pops into your head or think a little bit before you speak. Which one's easier, which one's better, right? Yeah, just hope that the relationship's all going to work out or actually lean into it and work on it. Which one's easier, which one's better? Just spend whatever you want to spend all the time or actually do a budget. Come on, you see what I'm saying? Like the easy way is not always the better way, and yet that's the way that many people want to live. Some people want to live the easy way. Other people, here's how they kind of try to live. They try to live the popular way. And that's what this looks like. It's like, I'm going to do what everybody else is doing. What are my neighbors doing? What am I seeing people do on Facebook or on Instagram? What is, what is the prop, popular trend? What is the culture saying? Let me just follow the crowd and do the popular thing, the thing that everybody else is doing. And don't get me wrong, there are times when we can gain wisdom and insight from other people, but oftentimes we follow the wrong people. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? And it's, and it's one thing to do the popular thing that everybody else is doing, but if we're really wise, we realize like the thing that everybody else is doing is leading them into debt and leading them into depression and leading them towards divorce or whatever other D word you want to throw in there, right? And I think mom might have been right when she said, if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge? See, sometimes we try to live the easy way. Sometimes we try to live the popular way. Here's another way that people try to live sometimes. They try to live their own way. I'm just going to do things the way I want to do them. I'm my own person. I can live how I want. I can do things my way. And that sounds good until you see what Scripture says. In fact, check out what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12. Look what it says. It says, there is a way that appears right, but in the end it leads to another D word. It leads to death. And so many people are living their lives trying to do things their way, trying to do it the easy way, trying to do it the popular way, trying to do it their own way. But here's what I want to tell you today. There is a better way. And that's what I got as I began to study through the scripture and look at the Christmas stories with kind of like a different kind of an eye, thinking, how can I teach the same thing I've taught 17 years in a row, but maybe teach it from a different angle? And as I began to look at this very familiar passage of scripture, this is what came to me, that there is a better way to live. And that is God's way, the wise way. In fact, let's look at it together in the, in the book of Matthew. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there, or it's on the LifeGate app. It should be on the screen there for you as well. And I want us to read it. It's a very familiar passage of Scripture, the same one that we look at every, pretty much every year at Christmas time. But I want us to see it through different eyes. And let's see what it says in verse 1. It says, And Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea. And during the time when Herod was the king, when Jesus was born, there were some what? Some wise men from the east who came to Jerusalem. And they asked, where is the baby who was born to be the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. Now, this is a very familiar story. All of us have heard it. It's the one that you heard the kids talking about on the video. It's the one that when you have the kids play, you see it enacted. You've got Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, and you've got the angels and the shepherds, and you always have the three what? The three wise men. I don't know why we say three. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that there were three. It's probably just because there were three gifts, right? We don't know how many that there were, but we know that there were wise men. The Bible calls them wise men. Some translations call them scholars. It was obvious that these were men that were of high intellect. These were guys who were very smart, but they weren't just smart. They were wise. And how many know there's a difference, right? Come on, how many know there's a difference between being smart and being wise? 
Being smart just means you know. Intellect means you have knowledge. But wisdom is that you are able to act on the knowledge that you already have. And here's the truth is there are a lot of people who are really smart but not very wise. Maybe there are some people even in this room today who know what to do. They're just not actually doing it. And the difference between smart or intelligent and wisdom is not that I just know what to do, but I know how to do it. And the Bible says that these men, they were scholars, they were intelligent, they were magi, they, they, they were smart people, but they weren't just smart. The Bible calls them wise men, and I don't think it's just because of the knowledge that they had. I think it was also because of the way that they lived. In fact, as I look at their story, in this little story, I can see three things. In fact, this is my Christmas gift to you today, all right? Three things that if you will do these three things, you will also learn to live the wise way. If you're taking notes, write them down. Number one, wisdom. Here's what wisdom does. Wisdom seeks out. Everybody say, seeks out. Wisdom seeks out. In fact, check it out in verse number two. It says, they asked, where is the baby who was born to be the king of the Jews? They were, they were seeking after Jesus. And here's the thing. I want you to understand. What is it that makes a wise person wise? Well, there's a lot of things. But one thing that really sticks out to me is that a wise person is wise because they recognize that they don't know all the answers. A wise person is wise because they recognize, I don't know everything, but I'm willing to seek until I find the answers. Now, take the reverse of that, and what is it that makes an unwise person unwise? Unwise people, what makes them unwise is they assume that they already know. What is it that makes people unwise is that they think they already know. They think they already have all of, the ex all of the answers. But let me just tell you something here today. You can't learn anything if you already know it all. And how many know some people that are like that? Come on, how many know some know-it-alls? You know what I'm talking about, right? And here's the thing, a know-it-all, you can't tell them anything because they think they already know it all. In fact, I like this quote that I heard one time. It says, the greatest hindrance to discovery is not ignorance, but the illusion of knowledge. You know what the thing that keeps us from learning, the thing that keeps us from finding, the thing that keeps us from wisdom is when we think we already know. It's not that we are ignorant, it's that we have this illusion of thinking that we already have it all figured out. And unwise people are not willing to admit, maybe I don't know. But wise people are willing to admit, there are some things that I don't know, but I am willing to seek until I find those answers. And here's what I know about every person that's in this room today. That this room is filled with wise people. Just look at your neighbor, nudge him, tell him, you're a wise guy. No, don't do that. Just say, you, like, you're wise. Come on. How do I know that this room is filled with wise people? I'll tell you how I know. Because you're here. Right? There's some of you that come every single Sunday. And you sit there with your notes open, your Bible open, and you're hungry, and you're ready to learn. Your mind is open. And I know that you are wise because you show up every week seeking God's answers in your life. There are others of you that are just here today because someone invited you. It's Christmas Sunday, and you decided, okay, I guess I'll go. But guess what? I know you have at least some wisdom as well for the fact that you just showed up today, that you are open to understanding, you are seeking the things of God. And here's the great news. Come on, there's great news today. And the great news is this. If we will have this posture of saying, I understand that I don't know, but I am seeking, then guess what happens is that God has promised to us that if we will seek, that we will find. In fact, the scripture says it through the prophet Jeremiah. Check out what it says in Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. He says, God says, call to me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and unsearchable things that you did not know. If you would just have the posture of these wise men, you would be wise as well. That if you would just come saying, I don't have all the answers. I don't know all the answers. I don't know if my way is the best way, but I'm looking, I'm seeking, I'm searching the better ways. The Bible says when you call upon him, he will show you things that you, you didn't understand and you didn't know. Jesus said it like this in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will what? You will 
fine. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open to you. Jesus says, hey, if you're here with an open heart, seeking after the things of God, then guess what's going to happen? He will be found. And there maybe there's some of you that are here today, and you're a Christian, and you're looking today for answers. You've got decisions that you need to make in your marriage, or in your business, or in your finances or in your health, and you're, you're looking for wisdom and discernment. Here's the good news. If you will seek today, God will show you. The Bible tells us in James that if any man lacks wisdom, he can ask God and God will give it to him Amen. without finding fault. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian and you're just checking things out, good news is that when you seek him, he has promised that he will meet you right there. And if you will open your heart, you will find him as well. See, that's what wise people do. Wisdom is people who will seek out. But the second thing I noticed about wisdom from this passage and from these wise men is that wisdom doesn't just seek out, but wisdom also looks up. So everybody say, looks up. Looks up. Here's the thing about these wise men and what wisdom does. Wisdom doesn't just seek. Wisdom knows to seek in the right places. In fact, look at our verse again in verse number one. When Jesus was born, some wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, and they asked, where is the baby who was born to the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. Now, I want you to notice something. I'd never noticed this before until I started studying and preparing for this message. It doesn't say we saw the star. What does it say? It's right up there. What does it say? It says we saw his star. I always thought it said we saw the star, but that's not what it says. It says we saw his star. There were lots of stars, but they weren't looking to all the other stars. They were looking to his star. They didn't just seek. They sought in the right place. They didn't just look around. They looked up for the answers. And can I tell you something today? There are all kinds of places that you can seek and that you can look for wisdom. But you're not going to find the right wisdom unless you're searching in the right place. You're not going to find the right answers unless you're looking to the right person. And so many times we look for wisdom in all of the wrong places. In fact, let me ask you today, where are you seeking for wisdom? Some of you, you're seeking for wisdom from what the culture is doing and what everyone is saying and the things you see on the news or the things you see in social media. Some of you are searching for wisdom from your friends. Some of you are searching for wisdom from within. But can I tell you, if you search for wisdom from the wrong places, it's going to lead you to the wrong things. If they had have followed the wrong star, it would have led them to the wrong place. And so we have to determine, hey, I'm not just seeking. I'm seeking in the right place. In fact, this is what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and verse 18. Look what he says in the Living Bible. He says, stop fooling yourselves. If you count yourself above average in intelligence as judged by the world standard, you better put all of this aside to be a fool rather than let it hold you back from true wisdom from above. In other words, here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you think you're really smart and you think you're going to find wisdom from the world, man, it's going to be the thing that's going to trip you up from finding the true wisdom. It's better to be foolish in the eyes of the world than to think that you are smart because you believe all the things that the world is saying because that's what's going to keep you from what true truth and wisdom that God wants to bring in your life. Verse 19, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. The thing that everybody else, the things that everybody else is saying are wisdom. In God's eyes, those things are foolish. As it says in the book of Job, God uses a man's own brilliance to trap him. He stumbles over his own wisdom and falls. And again in the book of Psalms, we are told that the Lord knows full well how the human mind reasons and how foolish and futile it is. In other words, here's what, here's what Paul is saying. He's saying the world thinks it's so smart. The world thinks it's so clever. The world thinks it's got it all figured out. And if we're not careful, we can fall into that same trap of thinking that we have it all figured out. But it's a trap. That's the thing that actually holds us back. Thinking that we have it figured out is the thing that holds us back from discovering true wisdom 
for our lives. In fact, the scripture says it like this in Proverbs that here's where real wisdom comes from. In Proverbs 9 and verse 11, in the NCV, it says wisdom begins with respect for the Lord. And understanding begins with knowing the Holy One. Like if we want to really know the right way to live, we're not going to look to everybody else. We're going to look to Him. And when we come to Him with with respect and with honor, and when we draw close to Him, then He begins to show us what real wisdom is all about. See, these wise men were wise because they sought out. They were wise because they looked up to where real wisdom comes from. In fact, James talks about what real wisdom even looks like. Look at this in James chapter 3 and verse 16. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But wisdom from where? From above. What does it look like? It's first of all pure. It's also peace loving. It's gentle at times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and and the fruit of good deeds. And it shows no favoritism and is always sincere. In other words, James is saying, hey, the wisdom of this world, the world says, hey, look out for yourself. Do what you want to do. Do what makes you feel good. You can decide for yourself. You can identify as whatever you want to identify with. Come on, how many know this is what the world is telling us, right? But where does it lead to? Well, it says it right there. It leads to evil and disorder of every kind. And isn't that what we see in the world around us today? But God's wisdom, come on, when we begin to seek God's wisdom, here's how we can recognize what it is. It's going to be pure. It's going to be peace-loving. It's going to be gentle. It's going to be willing to yield. It's going to be full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. And when we begin to live this out, we begin to experience his blessings and his provision on our lives. See, what does wisdom do? Wisdom seeks out. Wisdom looks up. But then I want you to notice the third thing from these wise men about wisdom is that wisdom doesn't just seek out and look up. But notice this, number three, wisdom bows down. Check out our text again in verse number one. When Jesus was born, some wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked him, where is the baby who was born to be the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and we have what? Come to worship him. What made these wise men wise? I think it was because they recognized they didn't know everything. And they were willing to seek until they found And they were making sure that they sought in the right place. And when they came to the place where they discovered the truth, they bowed down in surrender. Can I tell you what's going to make you wise? What's going to make me wise? Is if we will be like these wise men. If we will come to a realization that we don't really know. That our way is not the best way. That the world's way is not the best way. But I'm willing to seek. That's why you're here today. I'm willing to seek until I find the truth. And I'm seeking. Come on, if you're here today, you're seeking in the right place. Praise God for that. And now that you have discovered the truth, you know what the wise next step is? Is to bow down and surrender to that truth. See, look what the scripture says in Psalm. Psalm 53, verse 1. It says, only a fool says in their heart that there is no God. The most foolish thing that we can do is deny that there is a God who loves us, who sent his son Jesus to die for us. The most foolish thing that we can do is we can decide, I'm going to live my way and not God's way. A fool will decide in their heart that there is no God, but those who are wise will be like these men. They will seek truth, and they will seek it in the right place, and when they find it, they will admit that that is true and they will surrender their lives completely to it. So that leads us to the key question today. The key question is this, what area of your life have you not yet surrendered? For some of you, maybe it's your family. Maybe it's your children and you're constantly trying to control and trying to make it all happen the way that you want it to happen. Maybe some of you, it's your marriage. Maybe for some of you, it's your finances and you're holding on so tight, trying to stay in control. For some of you, maybe it's, maybe it's your future and you've got it all planned out. And I'm going to go to this school and I'm going to take this job and I'm going to marry this person and we'll live in this neighborhood. And you've got all that. You're just trying so hard to control it. Some of you, maybe it's a relationship. 
Maybe some of you are in relationship with that guy or that girl that you know is not the right guy or girl for you, but you can't admit it in your heart and let it go and move on. For some of you, it's a habit, and it's holding you tight, and you haven't yet been able to let it go. For others of you, it's a hurt, and you're holding on to that so deep, and you just it's holding you back from living God's way. Some of you, it's an attitude. Some of you, it's an offense. Some of you, it's a belief or a behavior. And God is saying, seek truth and find it in me. And when you find it, come to that knowledge just like these wise men did. They recognize, I don't know, but I see a star and I'm going to follow his star. And when they came to Jesus, they bowed down and surrendered to him. For some of you, it means surrendering your life. In fact, there are some of you that are here today and you're seeking. You're like these wise men except that you've been seeking in the wrong places. You've been looking to maybe make more money or have more friends or go on more vacations or whatever it is that you are looking to and you look and you look and you search and you search and even when you find it, it doesn't fulfill you. There are others of you that for you, it just means you need to surrender. That many of you that are here today are not seeking, you already know the truth. You already know what you need to do. But it's more than just knowledge. Wisdom is that I'm willing to act on the things that I already know. Here's what I want you to do today. All over this room, I want you to bow your heads and and I want you to close your eyes. and, And maybe that's you in this room. You're one of those two things. Maybe some of you are here and you're seeking. Good news is today is... God can be found if you just seek with all your heart. See, the truth is every single one of us have sinned and we fall short of God's righteous standard. And there's no way that we could ever measure up on our own. It doesn't matter how good of a person we are. It doesn't matter how many times we go to church. It doesn't matter how much truth we know or how much of the Bible we have memorized. We're still never going to measure up on our own. But God loved us so much. That's what we celebrate at Christmas time. That God sent his son, Jesus, Emmanuel, to be with us. But not just to be with us, but to give his life for us. To pay the penalty for our sins. And that if we would just come to the place of acknowledging that. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. You know what that scripture is boiled down to? That word that I just talked about, surrender. It's the acknowledgement that my way is not the best way. God's way is the best way. And I'm confessing that with my mouth. I'm believing it in my heart. And if we come to that place, the Bible says that that's where salvation begins. That all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 1 John 1, 9 says it like this. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just. He will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So there are some of you that you are seeking. You don't have to seek anymore. You've found the truth. And now that you have found the truth, it's just a question of will I, will I admit it and will I surrender to it? There are others of you that are here today that you're not seeking. You already know the truth. You already know what God is asking you to do. You're just not really, really willing and ready to do that. But today is going to be the moment. When you're not just going to know what to do. You're going to take that next step. You're going to do it. Surrendering your life to Jesus. Thank you for joining us online today. Make sure and hit subscribe to this channel and hit the bell for more notifications. We can't wait to engage with you this week.